Okay, good morning, everyone. Maybe I want to start off with a question, a show of hands. How many of you think that China, or maybe the area that we are in, the Silicon Delta of China, is rapidly catching up with the Silicon Valley? Please raise your hands. Wow, we have uh, over 60%. And uh, how many of you still believe that there's a three to five year gap between innovators in China and innovators in the Silicon Valley? Please also raise your hands. Okay, it's not a debate, but we'll try to share with you some of the on the ground observations of uh, you know, the gap between China and the Silicon Valley. Maybe the first question to both of you. Uh, can you uh, help us identify some of the gaps between China and Silicon Valley? Maybe start with Anna. Um, the biggest gap is probably in the more adventurous entrepreneurs. But let me tell you first how I think China is closing the gap. Yeah. Um, if you look at the most popular, or this year, the latest model innovations in China, the top would be bike sharing, as most of you guys probably know already. I say, say. Bike sharing is number one. Um, subscription knowledge, sort of knowledge subscription model. Yeah. I don't yeah. know English how you say that. Knowledge subscription. Subscription. Yeah. Which is... Um, Basically, there's, uh, for example, Duodao under Lozi Sabe. Basically, it's people buying 20-minute uh, uh, 20 um, uh, podcasts podcast, yeah. uh, about uh, certain sectors started by KO, uh, sort of KOLs talking about um, certain sectors that they're really familiar with. And it's people wanting to actually spend uh, basically $30 to pay for an annual subscription of knowledge. So that's uh, a new model. And third would be sort of AI is another hot area in investing. So I think if you look at these three areas, um, I actually think China's leading uh, Silicon Valley in all of these areas. So for bike sharing, I mean, the US is um, sort of trying, and all around the world, actually, Israel, they're all trying to copy bike sharing. You have Lime Bike in Silicon Valley. I mean, uh, we're investors in OFO. OFO's grown to almost 30 million rides per day, which is, um, I think, maybe even higher than DD yeah. now. Yeah. It's incredible. When we invested last year, uh, I think it was in April, they were only on campuses. They, didn't even, they weren't even in cities. And now you see them sort of everywhere in yeah. uh, Beijing, Shanghai. Yeah. All, they're in 100 cities now. Um, that explosion, I mean, our, you know, our valuation when we came in to now is you know, over 100x, right? I mean, it's crazy. So that's one. And the subscription model, for example, last week, there's this um, a uh, mental psychiatrist person who offered his course. And within the span of 24 hours, there were um, basically 5 million purchases for 199 RMB. That's wow. just in 24 hours. So you see this explosion of consumer uh, desire yeah. for, for knowledge. Yeah. And then in AI, the third sector, um, you know, I would say China's been really good about finding applications for AI, uh, whether it's self-driving um, or it's security. You know, a lot of US, China, Chinese uh, security bureau is using uh, one of our companies, E2. Um, and in America, you know, it's the government that owns your data. But in China, you know, the government is actually willing to use third party for a lot of their security um, AI data processing, which is you really You can highlight actually two important things. A, of course, is the speed to the market, the speed of innovation. B, of course, is the innovation of business uh, models. So are the, uh, are, uh, what about the other areas mm. that China still has a kind of gap between? I think, for example, I'm really excited about neural language is Elon Musk's new br brain machine inter interface company. Uh, and I think there are some people in China trying to do that. But that um, type of really crazy or, uh, I don't know, aspirational uh, breakthrough disruption, I think we need more of that in China. And then EHAM, uh, yeah, which is yeah. also one of our portfolio companies, I think they've done a really good job with their flying car, for example. But um, you know, we need more of that. And for that, you really need global talent. I mean, like yeah. Elon Musk is from South yeah. Africa, right? Like, yeah. China is not an easy place for foreigners to do a startup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So Derek, share, share with us your observation, the gaps. Yeah, so my observation is more from the entrepreneur, yeah. you know, perspective uh, instead of just, you know, like instead of like having a really big picture. So for for a company like us, we're kind of the uh, company that is kind of rare in China because from the day one, we never position ourselves as a local Guangdong company, as a traditional hardware maker, or mm -hmm. we just, you know, take advantage of the traditional uh, manufacturing facilities. And from day one, we actually we went global. So we were. Uh, after the company was established like for five months, I went to Silicon Valley to start the very first crowdfunding campaign mm. for our consumer level drone. Then 
in the end, it was, I mean, it turned out to be pretty well. Um, I guess that's our like a DNA. So from our perspective, um, I think U.S. or Silicon Valley is still ahead of China in many ways, especially let's say traditional strong like you know you got a lot of really really top talents like talented engineers in the U.S. and now because of the fast development and because of all those like a mobile internet thing in the past 10 years, uh, I think China is catching up with the, that kind of like a software talent as well. Um, but still, I can see the gap is being, you know, um, lied between, you know, the, the collaboration or the bridge between the academic side, you know, the school, like bad schools yeah. to the startup companies. Uh, you can see a much, much stronger tie uh, in Silicon Valley that there's a lot of like technology patent uh, being transformed from uh, universities to innovative companies. Well, in China, this gap is bigger than U.S. Yeah, yeah. So that's the uh, first thing. The other thing I can see something that China, you might want to take advantage of the China current policy, because China government is really trying hard to promote this whole spirit of entrepreneurship, not only because of economy slows, but also I guess it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a kind of like a new way of showing like, what the country's you know, spirit it is. So we actually, as a hardware company, uh, we benefit from this a lot in China as well. Um, like what we're doing, we're making a flying car. Traditionally, you wouldn't even imagine that. Like yeah. the government is going to allow some kind of like, you know, self-made flying car to to go on like to do tests in big cities like Guangzhou. Yeah. But now we're doing. To, but now like like we're testing our passenger drones every single day yeah. in you know in big cities like Guangzhou. So. Mm. The government side has seemed to be more and more open as well. Yeah, so the government is very innovation driven, but the academics still lags behind in terms of really turning professors into entrepreneurs. But there's also a kind of comparison. The Economist has covered the Silicon Delta, we call it this area, and Silicon Valley. One of the key differences, of course, is that Silicon Delta is very good for smart manufacturing, for companies to really get their hands dirty and start prototyping uh, stuffs, right. build stuffs, whereas Silicon Valley is still uh, pretty much a leader in software. Is it true I according to your observation? So my observation is on the traditional hardware side, yeah. or maybe we're, today we're talking about like smart manufacturing in China, uh, made in China, you know, 2025. You know, when we talk about that, I think China is still the best place to be, because mm. we have a lot of, uh, you know, we used to have a lot of competitors um, two years ago, three years ago in U.S. or in in, in Europe, but now you can see like 100% of the drone manufacturers are are now from China. Basically, okay. I mean, on the, I'm talking about the consumer level, yeah, not yeah. on the, you know, not on the commercial level. So I think that's true. On the software side, I feel like China still have to catch up, just, just like what I said, um, you know, due to the you know, significant growth of this whole mobile internet um, in the past like five, 10 years. I think now it's getting better because we don't actually hire any, um, you know, like, you know, we don't hire any R&D people like um, outside China. I mean, not only because, it's not because they're not talented, it's, it's, it, you know, it's more or less considered as, uh, you know, like easier to management, okay. like so people can stay together and so they can work on like together. Yeah. One other element I think is uh, very different is uh, the overall market environment and also the consumers. Anna, maybe you start with you. What's your ob observation of consumers in China? Because they are saying, saying the Chinese consumer are the most demanding and also at the same time most willing to take up new things. If I just look at you know, people in America, um, they don't have that many apps on their phone, you know, like I, my, uh, my personal observation, whereas yeah. China, like any person I meet, random person on the street, I'm seeing they almost have more apps than I do, you know, there's this yeah. willingness to try new things that's really incredible. And th about the bikes, I mean, that's just, they're on the street, they're yeah. everywhere, it's really hard to miss them. And that's been a really interesting marketing effect, just to see it and be able to tr use it and then just dump them anywhere, right? I mean, that new sort of consumer strategy, I think, is really awesome. And with the consumers, I think there's also a new market for um, cheaper items. So with bikes, it's only one RMB. Um, another area that's been really uh, popular this year has been, um, or VCs popular, is funding the uh, like okay. the Wi-Fi, yeah. yeah. uh, your phone charger, like phone yeah. charger um, installation, all these places. And again, that's just you pay like 50 cents or one RMB to charge your phone. So it's this new um, unit of lower price things that consumers are actually willing to 
try for very cheap. Yeah. So I think consumers are really open. Yeah, it's kind yeah. of interesting because when I talk to Mobike, I know that when they introduced that in Singapore, they charge us one sing dollar for a ride, which is five or six times at least yeah. what's in China, right? Yeah, actually in the US, because all these bikes are kind of going to the US and a lot of their, um, like I was trying, I was looking at BlueGoGo and their s sign up fee is 99 US dollars, right? But wow. in China, like Ofo to sign up yeah. is only 99 RMB. Yeah. Yeah. Which is 15 US dollars. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. much, much lower. That's much yeah. lower, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so in a way, what, what's your observation about consumers? Because I think we've seen the consumers are really driving all these changes and they want new things and they want you know, new things coming up very quickly, right? Yeah, so I got my own theory about this. So I think yeah. it's not just about the business model or technology, because if you look at those shared bicycle model or the portable charger model, it's nothing new in the, you know, from the technology side, mm -hmm. but it's more about people's mentality. Yeah. I think China definitely has this kind of special, um, you know, thing of, you know, like the consumer just more easy to adapt into, you know, new things and new stuff. I guess part of the reason was being uh, because China was missing the previous, you know, generation or waves of innovation because Chin Chinese people are just, you know, like, a, like directly, you know, come from, you know, without a PC, then just you know, suddenly everyone has a mobile phone. And, you know, like there was not as many PC in China as, you know, was sold in the U.S. or other developed countries. So Chinese consumers are much, much more adaptive, like, to new technology because they just do not, ha I mean, because just... I guess in their brain they just don't have any like a pre you know like a pre set up thing. So yeah. I think that's are you saying that the, the Chinese consumers are actually get, getting used to leapfrogging? Yeah, they're just like every you know like they just get used to all the new stuff. Okay, yeah. I think one other yeah. important thing is also WeChat. Yeah. Um, if I think yeah. because now that's like true. for me to download an app, I feel like there's. The, like there's a lot of like chum, like cost yeah, yeah, and yeah, downloading like cost, an app yeah. that takes like a minute, right? I mean, in China <laughs> with our Wi-Fi, it takes a minute. But um, you know, in WeChat, like I don't really have to download an app. I mean, I'm an investor in Ofo, and I think I just downloaded their app like last month. But I've just used their WeChat interface, yeah, yeah. which is so easy. And then I just pay through WeChat, so I don't. I mean, everything is just so easy yeah. because the, of WeChat. Th th there's a saying that of course WeChat is becoming an ecosystem where it's benefiting from the uh, mobile the mobile internet as well as ease of payment. But is there a concern? Because we know that when WeChat tries to uh, expand into other markets, it's not that easy, where Facebook or Smart, other yeah. social media is more, uh, much more, uh, being much more used. So is there a concern that China is creating its own ecosystem, which is quite different from many other markets? Because the example would be Japan 20 years ago. Imagine in Japan in 2000. You know, Japanese have very interesting right. consumer gadgets yeah. that's only available in Japan. But, you know, people find it very useful. The young kids are playing with all these things, but not that easy to be exported in other markets. Is there a concern? I actually think maybe five years ago, I think yeah. China was mostly insular. But if I look at all the startups, like look at Ihan, like they're yeah. pretty global. He spends half his time not in China, right? He's in yeah. Europe, US. Um, I had like one of my, this audio, like sort of Himalaya-like yeah. podcast startup called CastBox, half their users are in the US and Europe. Um, and then I have this new um, e-commerce startup in Hangzhou named Club Factory. They're selling 90% to India. So I think, and then look at Xiaomi. So I think, and, and Cheetah Mobile. So I think there's so many companies that are, for some reason, just all of a sudden, just global. I feel like in the span of a year, everyone's, you know, global, going global has been a yeah. theme. Yeah. And last year, all the VCs were looking at Southeast Asia opportunities. Everyone was like, the hot trend was going to Southeast Asia, you know? Yeah. Right. I feel like this is really depends on what kind of business, you know, sector you're in. Mm. Like, if you're in a hardware business sector, it's just, you know, much easier to go global because human beings like are just the same. Like it's, especially when you talk about gadgets. Like if you think of a PC, smartphone, because you don't really need to worry about the culture difference when you are producing some yeah. kind of like hardware. But talking to things about WeChat, you know, like because different countries have their own, you know, like a social protocols and culture difference. So people in Japan use Line, you know, in US use WhatsApp and China. Even though I, I personally feel like WeChat is like ten times you know, easier to use yeah. than any other 
<laughs> like a social messaging app, but still it's within China. Yeah. And to answer your question, like whether China has is, is creating its own system, I feel like that's always the way we have to be because okay. because of the Great Firewall. Yeah. You know, like yeah. it yeah. just like it's it's also one of the good things for the China local entrepreneurs because yeah. you just get much more space to you don't have to compete with Google. I mean, I believe like free market, but still, you know, you got yeah. you got a lot of time and space yeah. to to you know to avoid the compet yeah. direct competition yeah. from like Amazon. Amazon, Google, YouTube, all these companies. Yeah. That's why China is creating its own ecosystem. Yeah. You talk about Great Firewall, and I think it's kind of interesting because when we talk about globalization, China is a leader in globalization, but in an area where really try to facilitate the exchange of ideas. It's, it's an area that we find it challenging. And then uh, going back to what Anna and Derek has said you know, about talents, because at the end of the day, China cannot always be a winner in terms of creating new business models. China need to have, you know, to, to be able to attract really great innovators, people who have innovative ideas. So give us a few suggestions on what China could do better in terms of really attracting talents as well as making entrepreneurs in China more innovative in terms of thinking bold, big ideas. Mm. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I can actually tell the big difference between these two generation of the entrepreneurs yeah. in China. So if you go to go back to those entrepreneurs, you know, they started from 80s, 90s. They are more like the pioneers. They are, you know, they have the courage. They have the gut to start a business. Yeah. And uh, back in, if, if you just like track back 30 years ago, you know, back in China, just like whatever business sector you are in, you are going to make a lot of money. And they also have kind of like a traditional entrepreneur like spirit because it's 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 more China. It's more like a Chinese culture. It's always about people connection, about guanxi, about you know like it, it, it's about partnership uh, with government. Mm. But I, but I'm kind of feeling that this new generation of the entrepreneur, especially if you go to those you know kids who is born after 1990s. Uh, they are more international. They are born to be global because they never experienced any kind of like hard times in China. I, I, I mean, since they were born, so they have a completely different mindset, you know, like mindset compared to the old guys like us. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I guess like uh, you know, the suggestion is always that I think I, I believe I, I personally believe that with the growing of this kind of like new generation of entrepreneurs and uh, you know y younger entrepreneur like younger people, they're gonna they'll be able to attract more and more you know international talents because people will be able to close their you know will be able to close in their gap and share a similar you know mindset from other culture. I think I mean I mean that's just the way yeah. I I see things. Yeah. Anna? Yeah, I agree. I think the new. Um, the new entrepreneurs are really the 1990s crowd, um, and also serial entrepreneurs. I think uh, if you look at like uh, Mei Tuan, Wang Xing, or Tou Tiao, Zhang Yimin, they're all they've all done like four or five yep. startups before before they found the new one. And I think um, that's the old generation. But the new ones, the 1990s ones, they're just like American kids, yeah. and they're very global. So I think we'll see that wave kind of change. Yeah. Do Do we yeah. need to be all like? Does the newer generation need to be like American kids, or is there also a Chinese element that will make them even more successful in the future? Maybe one quick answer. Yeah. Gosh, do you want to start first? I don't have yeah. an answer yet. Yeah, I don't feel like there's a typical type of American kids. Yeah. It's more about you know like international. Okay. You know, it's more like a, you know like a global mindset because. People are starting to closing their gaps in terms of their mentality, in terms of the culture difference, in terms of their mindset. I feel like people just start to, you know, like, because the way in the traditional China, like, 80, like 30 years ago, is very, very different, like from now on. Yeah. 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 So the global I would say they're mindset. They're probably very mobile focused. Yeah. The yeah. new generation. Yeah. yeah. The mobile. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so hope is actually in the post 90s and also the millenniums. So with that, we want to close wow. uh, this session. Thanks, Anna and uh, Derek, for your wonderful speeches. Thanks. Yeah.